Well, good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to make a start, although there are still one or two people uh, coming in because we do have uh, quite a bit to get through this evening. Uh, I'm Howard Davis, the director of the school, and it's my role to be kind of master of ceremonies this evening. I have to say that in this school, I quite often feel a bit of a fraud when I am presenting research done by members of the faculty. Um, in fact, when I say quite often, I would say almost invariably consider, uh, I can feel myself a fraud, except tonight, um, because this is a project uh, in which I have been uh, involved, although somewhat intermittently, but actually for right from the beginning of the uh, project, when we first uh, made a bid to the Joseph Rowntree Fund uh, to support this work. And I have taken a particular interest because when I, in a pre one previous life, I ran the Audit Commission here, and we did quite a bit of work on urban regeneration, particularly looking at the structures and governance of urban regeneration. So the subject interests me a great deal. And we were delighted when uh, Joseph Rowntree agreed to support the project, and we were able to dovetail it with some work being done by Bruce Katz, whom I've also known for a long time, at the Brookings Institution. And so we're very grateful, particularly to uh, Joseph Rowntree, um, but also to Brookings for their support uh, for this work, and I want to say that right at the start. And we've also had very good support from other countries' governments in the EU, including our own, from the cities involved in the project, the seven of them you will hear about, uh, and indeed from the European Commission, uh, who have not only supported but have participated actively in the work and made uh, some very interesting <coughs> presentations. I attended several of these sessions, uh, as is as with anything organized by Anne Power. Uh, there's usually a lot of eating and drinking, but in the middle of all of that, um, there have been some rather interesting uh, discussions and even quite uh, serious ones. Um, and this has, I think, been a very productive project. I mean, one reason why it particularly appealed to me is because it was or is an attempt to learn lessons from successful and indeed from, frankly, unsuccessful policy interventions in these cities. And all of the cities concerned were, I think, very frank about what had worked and what had not worked. And I tend to have a prejudice of thinking that in the public policy arena, you can often learn as much from an analysis of things that didn't go successfully um, as of projects that did go well. And so this had a very practical focus in trying to tease out from the stories of these seven cities what works, and therefore we think something which will be very thought-provoking for anyone involved in attempting to work on the regeneration of cities affected by industrial decline. And the other dimension of it, which particularly appeals to me because I tend to believe there is too little of it in public policy work, is that it is a cross-country study, both cross-country within the European Union, uh, but also, of course, transatlantic, uh, in that we had another group of what the Americans call weak market cities to compare with the cities in Europe. And I think that just the bumping off against each other of the city reformers in Europe and the US um, has been, if anything, the most important part of this work. And I think this is a particularly good example, therefore, of what we are now being told in universities in this country we have to do a lot more of, which is to look at the impact of our research. Uh, this is the current mantra of the funding councils and the research councils asking for evidence of impact of research done uh, in the school. Uh, obviously, uh, it's easier for some areas of the LSE to produce evidence of impact than others. Uh, I think the philosophers uh, can show that their ideas have real world relevance. Obviously, the economists have much more difficulty uh, <laughs> with that. Um, but the last thing I would say is that another excellent thing about this research is that the book 
is frankly great to look at. I think the publishers have done a really terrific job with it. Uh, and if you want non-academics, people in the policy world to read things, then I think it is good to spend a bit of time and a bit of effort on making sure that it's accessible and interesting and really a pleasure uh, to hold. And that allows me uh, to advertise the fact that the book is on sale um, outside at a discounted price. Um, and we very much hope that people will take it away with them. There'll also be a reception uh, afterwards at a very heavily discounted price, i.e. zero. Um, there is no end to our generosity uh, this <laughs> evening. And we hope that you will stay behind for that too. But I should just now explain the sort of choreography of this evening. We're going to have three presentations, one from Anne Power, um, looking particularly at the work that's been done in the project, the key lessons from these Phoenix cities. Um, then we're going to hear from Bruce Katz of Brookings uh, on the future of cities in Obama's America. Uh, it's still Obama's America, I guess. Uh, last yeah, time but, I checked. Uh, part of his uh, difficulties. Um, <laughs> I guess he is still president. Well, it's good to have Bruce's confirmation that, uh, that he still is. Um, and then um, Richard Rogers uh, will be the third, uh, who will talk about what the urban renaissance means for the 21st century. And then after that, we have shorter interventions from three panelists, uh, Oliver Weigel, Juan Alayo, and Tony Travers. Um, and then we will attempt uh, to wind up uh, by 7.45 in time for you all to have a drink and to buy the book. Uh, so without more ado, the prime mover of the project and power is going to present the conclusions to us. Anne. Well, it's been a very long and complicated process getting to the point where we thought we could even modestly claim to understand Phoenix cities. Uh, before I go through a very scampered version of what we discovered, and the long version is between two covers, as Howard has just explained, I would like Jörg Ploger and Astrid Winkler to stand up, uh, because uh, they are my two co-authors, they have been my two co-researchers, they have been absolute rocks and beavers and bees <laughs> and ants in a very, very complicated and amazingly challenging process. Between us, we mustered all the languages that we needed, and so we literally went to ground in the seven cities and got the true story. And I really can't thank them enough. <laughs> I'm going to use the seven cities, and I've got photographs which I am literally going to flash up. Um, I can't guarantee they're all in the book. In fact, they're not all in the book, but you will just have to try and get the flavor of the pictures because I thought it was very important to show what we actually learned as well as to say what we learned. So I'm going to explain what we learned and only show the pictures. So, first of all, what is a phoenix? A phoenix is a magical bird that constantly renews itself. It lives for hundreds of years and then burns to ashes, but out of those ashes always rises a new phoenix to start the cycle all over again. And somebody in the LSE had the inspired idea to call our cities Phoenix Cities. It's eagle-like with red and gold plumage. It is a symbol of death and resurrection according to the Oxford Encyclopedia very symbolic. So what are Phoenix cities? They're majestic historic magnets in dominant locations with vast natural resources that spawn manufacturing giants of world class, but along the way wrecked their social environments and their natural environments in order to produce the vast wealth on which they came, these cities came, to dominate their nations and the international industrial revolution generating huge inequality, squalor, and disorder. So was it what you would call troubled progress? Was it self-destructing? Yes, it did self-destruct. Did it recover? 
and we use Hib Bilbao to just show that process very, very troubled and now in spite of Spain's very, very severe recession, the most severe in Europe, not looking as badly hit as the rest of Spain in spite of having had very severe job losses, loss of investment and so on, like all the cities. These are the seven prize examples across Europe that I'm going to draw, draw on. So what actually happened to them? A long time ago, they went into slow decline, sometimes after the First World War, sometimes after the Second. These resources that they had relied on, their natural resources, were played out by 1980. And so they're huge industries, the biggest shipbuilders, the biggest steel producers, the biggest coal mines, the biggest engineers, collapsed. City cores and warehouses fell completely idle. People left. There were empty homes. There were empty offices. Jobs left. And most people didn't leave. So these cities had grown to a huge size and then lost 10, 20, even 30% of their population. The worst city hit was Belfast, lost 70%, uh, lost 30%, but 70% remained. And those were devastated communities. Poverty rose, and there was a despairing defense of old industries in all our cities, an attempt to recover that grandeur that they had lost. And we use Belfast to illustrate this very, very struggling process towards regrowth. Belfast, again, holding up better than uh, you would have expected, partly because of the euro favouring Northern Ireland rather than the Republic. But there hasn't been a magic rebirth from the ashes of destruction, unlike a real phoenix bird. Um, there's been a very slow and laborious reclamation of old assets, a new kind of rebirth through restoration um, inspired city leadership in all of these places was born from the ashes and so there were turning points on the realization that there was no going back and maybe Torino is the most impressive example of that turning point suddenly there was the election of a mayor a non-political mayor a completely new ferment of ideas and activity in the city driven by a strong consultation a strong neighborhoods focus lots of emphasis on social enterprise, but new challenges. A hugely successful market was born in the big central square, grew and grew, and is now at a point where the city can barely cope with its impact and implications. So what new approaches did emerge um, from these cities? Um, well, land contamination and recycling, the industrial heritage suddenly, instead of being up for demolition was up for revaluation, restoration of public buildings and public spaces, lots of innovative small enterprises and new skills, um, very strong focus on neighborhood renewal and integration because all these cities through their decay were in danger of strong polarization and ethnic separation, big public transport investment and other investments, very conspicuous symbolic projects in all of the cities. Um, and I'm using Saint Etienne to illustrate this. It was the biggest manufacturer of arms and the biggest manufacturer of cycles. That cartoon illustrates the disaster that it hit. And one of the reclaimed industrial sites with their new technology over on the right, reusing the site as an optic centre. I can't explain the whole story, but it, I swear it's in the book and it's a really good story. Um, turning their public spaces to good. It was a car park before. And then um, Saint Etienne, when we visited, very worried about the fact that it had so many small and medium enterprises. But Obama watchers will know that he's been very impressed by the fact that because small and medium enterprises in Europe carried on after the collapse of the Titanic type industries, they actually survived to today. Um, <coughs> One of the really decisive factors in this all working was the strong public backing these cities received. So they received backing from their local leadership, from their regional leadership, from the country leadership, and from the European Union. Again, I think the Brookings team has basically salivated, as they've said sometimes, watching how much public back backing was involved. Why did that happen? It was very costly because the density of infrastructure and people was so enormous, because it was relatively easy to restore city centers and public transport, because there were literally hundreds of miles of canals and riverfronts to reclaim. 
um, because new industries such as the optics uh, centre in Saint Etienne I just showed emerged on the back of the old industries. The new enterprises have basically followed on the engineering and high me mechanics and high skill traditions that these cities had evolved. And so inward investors were attacked, attracted both by the space that was available and the workforce that was available. And so re urban assets became revalued and their environments proved to be restorable and therefore populations started to rise again or in the case of two cities which are still struggling, uh, stopped declining um, and jobs recovered. Most of the cities actually came to the level of their national economies and in a couple of places overstripped their national performance over the last 10 years. Um, Bremen shows these things with its very fantastic heritage, its amazing port areas being restored, um, it's high-tech enterprise based for Airbus, as probably you all know, and also its strong program called um, Social City, basically investing in the most disadvantaged neighbourhoods. So you can see a kind of common pattern um, to the way these cities work. But the last two years, which is when our research ended and we started writing the book, uh, recovery has been severely shaken, sorry, Um, by the economic and financial turn, turmoil, by a loss of credit and investment, and by massive uh, resource constraints, both public resources but also private, not just private investors, but energy, steel, concrete, land, space, um, all sorts of um, problems, plus wider env environmental pressures such as congestion, sprawl building, pollution and flooding. And over this process, many job losses again and high youth unemployment with serious social inequalities and another turn of a precarious and uncertain future. Leipzig illustrates this very, very well, has done amazingly well, but you have to worry this um, enterprise here that we show, Quella, big logistics, um, warehousing, uh, marketing, servicing, goods um, operation in Germany is actually going to close at the end of March. Um, so, because of that turmoil, we came up with this model of Phoenix cities. They've gone through two really <coughs> impressive stark phases. The first industrial economy with explosive growth, social upheaval and environmental exploitation leading eventually to over-exploitation and collapse. Followed by a second post-industrial economy such as we studied with high public infrastructure, strong social integration and a new economy beginning to emerge. Therefore, recovery now they're facing this third resource-constrained economy, which, as Bruce and I were discussing just a while back, is very, very threatening and very uncertain. If cities understand resource-saving, public transit and other forms of investment in community resilience, and combine it with green innovation, then we feel that there is a potential for a new phoenix to emerge. And so there seem to be three scenarios. One, the cities are hit by further decline and go on struggling, and the American experience certainly is sharply um, in that camp at the moment. There's a second scenario which more closely reflects the European, which is a low-level survival, struggling <coughs> to hold on to jobs for dear life. And there is the potential for this much more positive scenario of operating within the new resource-constrained economy. Um, first of all, recognizing the finiteness of physical resources. Secondly, looking for new breakthroughs through research and development. Thirdly, attracting high public support and generating new knowledge and skills. We'll see which will win out. So, if we're going to pin our hopes on a resource-constrained economy within cities, then it's obvious that Europe and America face common challenges in a shrinking world. Necessity has always been the mother of invention in these cities. And I always remember Howard saying at one of our meetings, um, 
I'd rather be in Belfast than London over the next few years, meaning that these cities are closer to a survival mode of thinking and therefore um, have a more survival way of approaching problems. And innovation will break new ground. It is breaking new ground. Since we live in an urban age and it's easier to save energy in cities and we can't go on plundering the planet in order to allow city recover, then it seems to me inevitable that resourceful cities will create a third economy. And so this is how Sheffield is looking at it with lots of survival but lots of troubling youth unemployment and a real anxiety to actually link those young people. So this is a project that Sheffield has actually been funding for the last um, eight years, trying to link marginal young people who come from a steel production background, uh, which is the picture you see on the right, into the new opportunities that that land offers. So we are faced with three big questions. How will struggling cities emerge from the financial crisis? How will social programmes be funded and neighbourhoods renewed? And how will cities innovate on the back of resource con constraints? Will we just go on building outwards and therefore cause floods in our cities, or will we restore our cities? Will we sit forever in traffic jams, or will we generate a new kind of energy? Um, will we abandon our ghettos or will we resurrect them? Will we watch laymans being carried into the United States Bankruptcy Court or will we really go for the kind of innovations that maybe would make cities different? And just to end, this is a container ship which for the very first time anywhere in the world piloted commercially by a kite which saved 30% of the container ship's energy launched from Bremen, one of our cities, and over to the right in the Titanic old crane is the very first commercially uh, viable sea turbine uh, in Belfast. Those are two world firsts, and they are very, very important for our future. Um, we will actually find different ways. I think that's what our work shows. Thank you very much, Anne. I'm going to move straight on to Bruce from the Brookings. I don't know if someone wants to hit the lights. Um, when they used to do this in the White House, when Ronald Reagan was president, he'd fall asleep. Um, so I'm a little worried about that. Um, but this can we, be, can we, we do that? that? Might be better to do this. Yeah, that perfect. Right. So first of all, um, I just want to thank Anne and Howard and their colleagues uh, for what has been a superb collaboration and for this masterful piece of work, which is already having an impact in the United States. And I, I've been asked uh, to give a perspective from Obama land, and uh, I want to start where Anne left off uh, and really give a perspective view on these cities, partly because Americans have no memory. Uh, but, but also partly because uh, we have been deeply affected by the, the Great Recession. This has been a wake-up call uh, in the U.S. It, it really has shown an economy that is out of whack, which is frenzied with consumption, uh, which is wasteful in its use of energy, uh, which has been very successful in increasing in equity rather than sharing prosperity, and which has done a pretty good job of having Wall Street and Main Street at each other's throats. Um, and so what we've also seen is that it's a, it's a recession that has shaken our perspective of which cities are thriving and which are poised to thrive in the economy. And what I want to just quickly do is show you four older industrial cities, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, uh, Detroit, and Cleveland, and four real estate metros, uh, cities in the sand, uh, basically Miami, Tampa, uh, Vegas and Riverside to show you what has occurred. What you'll see from this very quick illustration is Baltimore and, Baltimore and Pittsburgh has compared, uh, have fared relatively well compared to the national average in the recession. Cleveland and Detroit, dependent on auto, have been affected pretty severely. But all the bubble metros that basically lived off real estate speculation have been hit very hard. 
If you look at unemployment, what you'll see with the exception of Detroit, that basically the bubble metros um, are having higher levels of unemployment because of the dramatic fall in the construction industries. If you look at foreclosures, again with the exception of Detroit, what you're seeing is real estate economies uh, literally built on excess are experiencing the worst of the foreclosure crisis. What, what this is doing in the United States is forcing a broad conversation, not just about industrial places lagging behind or real estate metros in transition, but about the very shape of the American economy. Uh, and President Obama, though somewhat distracted by health care, hopefully that will be over fairly soon, um, is trying to start uh, a broader discussion, a broader narrative about the future of the economy. And in that discussion, it basically lies the future of these older industrial places. So I want to basically have a very quick discussion that will follow three points. First, quick synopsis of the view of the American economy that is coming out of the Obama administration. It's a view where the American economy is more export oriented rather than consumption oriented, where there's a huge shift to low carbon, and where innovation fuels growth. Basically, we export more, we waste less, we innovate in what matters, and we produce and deploy more of what we invent. Second, that vision of the economy is a metropolitan vision, because metros are the engines of national prosperity. But it's also a vision, as I will argue, that if fully carried out, will favor many of the older industrial metros because of their unique attributes and assets. And the third piece of this discussion is to build this next economy, the US must connect the macro to the metro, this macro vision of an economy to the metro reality, a reality of entrepreneurs, of creative and innovative government, of new action, many of which are basically coming out of Europe. And as I'll close, I'll show you some efforts that are being taken in places like Cleveland that frankly point the way for national policy and state policy. So Americans always tend to be somewhat optimistic and affirmative. You might say delusional. Um, you'll, you'll get a piece of that. Um, let's first talk about Obama and other vision of the next economy. First, it's a vision where the US trades more goods and more services seamlessly with more parts of the world. This is a radical departure from the current state of affairs. The United States only has about 11% of its GDP dedicated to exports. Compared to 40% in China, 36% in Canada, you see uh, the numbers for India, the EU, and for Japan. Exporting has become almost an unnatural act in the United States. Only 4% of our companies export, only 0.5% of our companies export to more than one country. Large internal market, we didn't need to go outside. Can we get back into the export game? Critical because of the effect on consumption. Here's our future in the United States. It's also your future. As the world industrializes and urbanizes, that means new markets, new demand for trade, for goods, for services coming out of the rising nations, coming out of their mega cities. We believe the US can play at this expansion because we already play in advanced aircraft and spacecraft and advanced electrical machinery, and we can play in services. The biggest growth in exports in the United States to China and to places like India are in management consulting and professional services and architectural and engineering and construction services. So the president has basically put a goal before the United States, double our exports in five years. And as I'll show, that will have a dramatic effect on the older industrial metros that are the topic of this conversation. Sex, second vision of the next economy, move to low carbon. Uh, we have a ways to go. Uh, we have been very slow in the United States to embrace the green economy and to deal with climate change. And we are a bad actor. We have double per capita emissions of carbon dioxide as the UK and Germany. It's affected us economically. Only one of the top 10 solar production firms in the world is America. Only one of the top 10 wind turbine manufacturers in the world is America. And China is trying to win the race to green. They're trying to spend their way in, in, from a top-down perspective so they can capture the renewable markets and catch sustainable infrastructure and sustainable products. 
In the U.S., increasingly, low carbon is about markets because we finally understand the potential of this transformation. The energy we use is going to move from a dependence of fossil fuels to this broader mix of renewables, whether it's solar or wind or geothermal, and frankly, whether it's nuclear. The infrastructure we build is going to move from a 20th century uh, road and energy transmission matrix to ubiquitous broadband and rapid bus and high-speed rail and congestion pricing and smart grid. The products we buy are going to move from the high gas guzzlers of the U.S. We've invented all this to electric vehicles and energy efficient appliances uh, to organic food, LED lights. And the buildings we live and work in are going to move from the distended, sprawling landscape of the United States with energy inefficient buildings to buildings which obviously contribute to greenhouse gas reductions, but also places where we can walk more, spend less, and enjoy a higher quality of life. This is going to be fueled by innovation. Innovation has been the catalyst in prior periods of economic growth in the United States, as, as here. We saw it with the information revolution. We have seen it in healthcare. We have to do the same thing with clean energy. We basically, in the US, see ourselves, hopefully, as a place that can crack the code on green energy. We have a ways to go. We see our lead on innovation slipping, whether it's around R&D, whether it's around science. Our country is not oriented to science and engineering. We rank 45th out of 93 countries in the share of science and, that science and engineering degrees make up of bachelor's degrees. Luckily, we're a little ahead of Honduras. Um, and we've seen a shift in the trade of advanced technology products in the country that basically invented the iPod and the PC and everything else from a surplus to a deficit because we have not focused enough on manufacturing and production and deployment. It's time in the United States to rediscover our innovation mojo. That's what we need to do out of the rubble of this recession. Second major point, which has enormous effect on the older industrial places we're talking about. This transition is going to, to the next economy will be led by metros. This is the American economy. We're not a network of small towns. We're not some kind of agrarian nation. We are a metro nation, where 100 metros, after decades of growth, only sit on 12% of the land mass, but house two-thirds of our people, generate three-quarters of our GDP, and have all the assets that matter in the drive to the next economy. The world may be flat, but it's very spiky. The reason why it's such is that places like Chicago have in close proximity, they cluster and concentrate the large companies, the small and medium-sized enterprises that Ann just talked about, the research institutions, the specialized services, the skills providers, the business associations. That's why these metros, their cities and their suburbs together, this new geography, pack a powerful punch. Metros already dominate trade in the United States. These are the supersized performers, Chicago, LA, and New York. This is not what's coming through them. This is what they're producing, goods and services, over 50 billion a year. Here are the other nine super performers. These 12 together are a third of American exports. But it's not just the big places. It's some of the small places, including places like Youngstown, Toledo, and Grand Rapids in the Midwest, which have a large share of their gross metropolitan product dedicated to exports. If we want to become an export nation, you've got to start somewhere. Here's where we'll start. We're also going to start in those places where our air hubs, our sea hubs, our freight hubs, those are our metropolitan areas. Metros will also lead the race to green. Most of, of the green economy will be financed out of the top 100 metros. 94% of the national share of venture capital comes out of these places. When you look at our top clean energy research institutions, the bulk of them, 75% of the top labs, are located in our metropolitan areas. And if we're going to retrofit older homes, older buildings, older facilities, well, where are those places? They're in the places with the people, the top 100 metropolitan areas. Energy efficiency is a metropolitan act. If we're going to be the innovation nation, it will also be located in metropolitan areas. These places, again, two-thirds of the population, generate the bulk of our patents, our research funding, our college degrees, and advanced talent. So the bottom line is the next economy will be a metropolitan economy, 
even more than the current economy. And it may work to the benefit of these older industrial places. Let's look at the export share of, of that currently exists in older places versus the bubble places. Well, the bubble places have been built on consumption. They haven't been built on exports. Their exports are basically travel and tourism, as opposed to goods and high value services. Let's look at research funding. The older industrial metros have some of the best, most advanced research institutions in the world. Bubble metros, not really. Not much advanced research going on there. Wind and solar manufacturing, the older places are primed for this. They've got the technical expertise. They've got the skilled labor force. They know how to make things. Bubble metros, they know how to make houses. And jobs, patents, innovation, well, a lot of that's coming out of these advanced research institutions. The bubble metros don't really have those institutions, so the innovation that's going to fuel the next American economy is disproportionately going to come out of these places. So how do we get there? Well, we've got to connect the macro to the metro. The U.S. is not China. We're not going to dictate this out of Washington, D.C. We've got to follow a different playbook that is basically emerging from what is the DNA of the United States. Our entrepreneurialism, our dynamism, this intricate network of firms and research institutions and government and labor and capital. It's an interesting, complicated playbook by many European standards because we need a federal and state government which need to lead and we need metropolitan areas which need to innovate. Not just government, but networks of public, private, civic, university, and environmental leaders. Well, under Obama, we're beginning to move there, though obviously we have a long way to go. And as you might have heard, our politics have gotten a little polarized recently. But with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we finally have the first wave of investment in next generation infrastructure, in human capital, in innovation. In subsequent budgets, the president has put forward transformative ideas around post-secondary education, particularly for African Americans and Hispanics, and sustainable growth and neighborhood revitalization. And what is gaining currency in the United States right now, across parties, frankly, is also a vision of reshaping the federal government. So we have leaner, more entrepreneurial entities at the national level that can leverage up private sector financing and metro energy. Now, if that's what the federal government does, the metros need to do what they do best. They need to leverage their economic clusters because places are distinct. They need to connect transportation and housing. No one in Washington is going to tell a place how to grow. They need to strengthen their institutions for innovation and in education, not just at the high level, but community colleges, skills providers, K through 12. And they need to grapple with the shrinkage of cities in the older industrial portions of the country. This is happening today. For all the talk about polarization in the United States, entrepreneurialism still lives, and the cities and metros are the laboratories. If you go to Cleveland today, ravaged by this recession, you will see the Fund for the Economic Future, an interesting consortium of 60 philanthropies in Northeast Ohio, investing in next generation automotive and aerospace and clean energy and medical devices transitioning the economy from a, semi, from a union uh, polar focus on auto to something different. You'll see the beginnings of a different growth pattern. Rapid busways between downtown Cleveland and the university sector um, and, and the medical centers. You'll see the medical centers in Case Western University investing billions because these places together basically are the hub of a whole biomedical cluster in this part of the country. And you'll finally see a city like Cleveland, after decades of depopulation, along with their older suburbs, rethinking their growth. Basically taking the Phoenix City's book uh, and literally looking at Leipzig and Torino and Bilbao and Sheffield and say, if they could do this in Europe, we can do it as well. We can build again around our anchors, we can restore our rivers, we can basically grow in denser, smarter, stronger, greener ways. So let me just end with this. The recession is a wake-up call in the United States, like the Depression was. And the U.S. basically, though it's difficult, 
though we are intensely ideologically divided, does learn from mistakes. And what I think is going to drive the country forward, particularly given this polarization, is the energy on the entrepreneurialism and the dynamism and the creativity of literally thousands of corporate, civic, political, university, environmental, and labor leaders coming out of these top 100 metros. These metros understand the competitive challenges we face in the world. They understand that they have the assets to build on in their own economies and in their own places. And they are finally, I think, taking the bull by the horns and saying, we're a metro nation. It's time to start acting like one. That's the American perspective. Thank you very much. Well, um, in the normal way, I would be worried about uh, who was going to follow that. Um, but I'm not, uh, because we have a man, uh, Richard Rogers, who has never lost his innovation mojo. Um, so he doesn't need to refine it like the Americans do. Um, Richard, over to you. Thank you very much. Can we have the lights down, by the way? Whenever I'm invited by Anne, I always do what she says, and I've been doing it for 20 years, and it's the right way, I know. And looking at the book and glancing at the book, I haven't read it, it looks extremely interesting and exciting. As an architect, I'm going to talk about the de design in terms of places for people. I'm going to talk about the compact city, the only sustainable form we have in terms of redevelopment. And if I can find the right... <coughs> I put these buildings, just a, a flavor, buildings done by the practice I work with, because it is very much about public spaces. All these buildings have large public attraction, from Lloyd's of London to the Welsh Assembly to the Pompidou, which is perhaps the most successful uh, piazza or plaza, to uh, Barajas Airport in Madrid, and Leadenhall Street in London, which is not, a, not a, a erected yet, but will have a massive piazza underneath, underneath the building. The spaces for people are what it is about. It's really the meeting. I mean, the cities have a one specific reason to exist and have had that reason for the last five to th 6,000 years since when cities started to come together, which is for the meeting of people, for the exchanging of, exchange of ideas, for the exchange of trade, and for the very enjoyment of being in a physical environment. I shall also talk about the relationship between the quality of life and social inclusion. The street is the nervous system, the public <coughs> nervous system for citizens. We meet mainly in, in the street. I think that there should be a rights for public, public space, a hierarchy of public spaces from the doorstep to the great parks and the green belt. I do think that we may well see in the next 30 years the death of the car. It will, there will be other forms of movement, but the car is this great mass of steel with one person on it, cannot continue, and it's not going to continue. It's not going to continue. So one of the things whilst we're looking at all the other things that are going to happen, on the positive side, we should be looking at what we can do with space, and we are beginning to see it. Even in my sort of drive from my, uh, from my office, actually mainly by bicycle, um, you, I saw a whole lot of areas which already changed in terms of streets being taken over by public space, being narrowed, squeezing the, the car out and embracing the public activity. Another optimistic note, the South Bank, which until about 15 years ago was no, a no man's land. I remember well going there, arguing with various planners at different times that this should be obviously a, where there should be housing, where there should be cultural activities, where there is government and so on. The top diagram is really how it was about 15 years ago. And the amount of yellow on the South Bank was tiny. Basically, it was around what well, there was then city, it was city hall and the, and, and the festival hall. Since then, this immensely new and exciting activity area, the whole walk, you know, kilometers and kilometers, all the way down the South Bank. That takes some decision making. It doesn't look as though it's decision making, but it is, and it's been a tremendous improvement. London has changed radically in this last 15 years. 
when you look back, when I look back at London, not only where it was when I, when I started sort of studying architecture in the 50s, but even 15 years ago, it was a very grey city. The cultural mix that's happened within London, the foreign attack on the sort of establishment has been a tremendous success, and I hope it will continue. Talking about the compact city, looking at just two of the most unsustainable forms of development. One is sort of sprawl, this is Nice. There's practically nothing less left, as far as I can see, of most of the Mediterranean coast. Certainly nothing left of the south, of the south, coast, uh, of, the south uh, coast of France, except if you're a, million, a millionaire. It's all about cars, there's no contact, there's no meeting of people. There's no, any, not in really any point of making meeting of people because people, cars are antisocial, and of course, as I've said, they're useful. So that's one of the sort of, of the sicknesses that we have to face. The image on the right, which is really unfair because it was taken about 10 years ago and Manchester has changed greatly since then. But this is East Manchester where, and where Anne and I examined it with Ricky and many others uh, when I was chairing the Urban Task Force. There are about 80% of the buildings were actually empty in East, in, in, in East Manchester, 70-80% of the buildings. Of course it brutalised anybody that was left there because many people who were left there were people who couldn't afford or were sick so they couldn't get out of that area. And those people who did live in that there and then tried to leave couldn't afford to move into the centre and therefore moved into the country and so we're back to this, the question of sport. So the critical the key to all this is br the development of brownfield land. This is again a piece from the Urban Task Force, the anatomy of cities and communities, the importance of communities and the hierarchy of communities from the city centre and the concept again of all down around all these centres is that we need to intensify, intensify develop, development around transportation hubs. This basically is a hierarchy from, uh, if you like, from, from the centre to the district to the neighbourhood to the, to the cluster, the cluster around the bus stop, and all related about how can you walk to, tra to, to the public transport, first and foremost within five or six minutes, what is the form of city if you're going to do that, how can you apply this diagram to a city, the diagram on your right is actually applied to Manchester, and this is sort of shows also an interrelation between the communities uh, by public transport and then of course the, the city itself to other cities. Oxford Street, that's a pretty new photograph on the right. And of course it doesn't work. I mean, this is, must be one of the great cities in the world and it must be one of the least successful cities in terms of, human, of being a human space. It is better. I mean, cars are slowly being uh, cut out. There are now beginning to be cross, crossings which are much more public, but they're a long way from working. If one compares it with Strasbourg, another old slide, but one, it makes the point. You can see what, what this used to be, just like Oxford Street, full of, uh, of car parking, full of, of, of cars and so on, and now a calm public space. Again, I move forward from that back to the fact that we need to restrict streets so that they are, they're, they come, they're once more owned by the individual and by, by the people. I'm strongly against eco-towns, except if they are part of the brownfield development of cities. And basically, again, I have to say, I believe development should start from the centre or centres in the polycentric form and move outwards. I therefore have continuously, with many others, fought against the concept of new, of new towns in the countryside, not least because they are one class. Secondly, because, of course, you'll never be able to work in those, these small developments. There are five to 10,000 people. Uh, therefore, you will be going out, to some, you're going out mainly by car to work somewhere else. So they're not a, a live, work, leisure. Uh, place. So, brownfield, the same, the, same, well, again, the same quantity of brownfield sites are available today as they were eight years ago, despite uh, 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 substantial use. Now, for the last decade or so, we have used mainly brownfield sites. In London, nearly only brownfield sites. Yet there is the same amount, because it keeps on c coming on, online. I, I won't go through it in any detail, but the critical, uh, the idea that there's not enough brownfield or there's not enough areas where we can intensify development due to 
uh, low density development in places where there could be high density is not, is not correct. People often say, why do I love Croydon? Well, it just happens I have the images. <laughs> um, it's interesting about Croydon, and this is Croydon. It has tremendous public transport, both tram and train and buses. Um, but what's really interesting about Croydon is not only, I think it's the third largest uh, uh, office area, third or fourth largest office area in, Lo in London, and good, with good transport, but it doesn't work as a city, and it is morally simple. Um, if you look at, let's say, the middle image, the one with the green on it, and you had to put your finger on the basis that the brown is high density, you put your finger on the center, you put it on the brown. Not at all. It's white in Croydon. The center of Croydon is the lowest density, practically in Croydon. So there's a problem when you face that. Clearly, you need to build that. The left-hand image shows, again, housing, areas for housing, what one could start doing. Uh, we have looked at Croydon. Uh, John Rice has looked at Croydon. He's the chief executive there, and all, again, on the urban task force. <coughs> and we reckon we could easily put three or four eco-towns within Croydon. Surely that's where we should be starting, in towns like that. And on the, on the third slide to your right, you can see how empty Croydon is. Now, this can be true of many cities, because after all, Croydon is, in comparison with certainly uh, East, uh, East uh, Boroughs, is still moderately wealthy. So the principles of a compact city, the only sustainable form, I won't read through them because you can see yourself, but they are pretty obvious. I'll only mention one, and again, live, work, leisure, a range of use and so on. I just touch on the sort of secure and just. I think one of the, well, one of the things that have come out from this appalling economic situation in terms of the wealthy looking after themselves, the, the unbelievable greed of uh, financial fraternity is the gap between poor and rich. And the older I get, the more I think this is the fundamental problem we face. And it's interesting to see that the nations that have less of a gap between the bottom 20% and the top 20% have a much better living standard overall. The New London Plan, I worked for, I guess, about 10 years with Ken, with Ken Livingston. Um, and this is, is a few sort of headline figures. We're looking at a, a city which is going to be growing to sort of three quarters of a million over 10, 15 years. Um, we're looking at a city which is well contained by a green belt. We come back to this thing and We've been working on Paris uh, with LSC, um, and, we're being, and, we, and we realize that Paris continuously sprawls outwards. London has been, been, has been gifted in the 1940s by the concept of the Green Belt. And the idea that you should never move out of that Green Belt until all the brownfield land, until all the low-density developments near public transport have been used up is critical to any form of sustainable development. All, therefore, all construction on brownfield land, increased density around public transport, I've already mentioned, 50% affordable housing. Well, that's now gone, of course, with the, cha the change of, of mayor. We never got to 50%, but we got to about 37% of affordable housing built basically by all the private developers on the same site or on the neighboring site. I think that was a fantastic concept, to, start, to get a real mix within the cities rather than the ghettos which, we were, which have been built specifically in the post-war period, get okay, the poor in one area, the rich in another area. Major public transport investment, investment in bikes and so on, and all the way down, I won't go through it because again, you can see it yourselves. A study we made, I'm afraid, nearly 15 years ago in Pudong. Now, I often say that, you know, I went to, a bit like Marco Polo, about uh, 500 years, uh, 500 years, uh, five, sorry, uh, um, yes, 500 years later, um, I've, redis I've discovered the, the, the Far East, partly forced by the economic situation, and it is very different. It's interesting how, how we are still so European and American-centered. I think the world is moving. I think the center of the world today is the Pacific, it isn't the Atlantic, and it's not the Mediterranean. It, and what we'll see over the next 30 years, I think, could be ter terrible, but it could be f amazing, is that change over of power. Pudong, we were asked to look at the possibility of adding a city of about a million people across this tributary of the Yangtze. This is a wonderful city. This is about 15 years ago. 
um, with these great buildings all along, along it, and this more or less brown field and semi derelict land across it. No links at all when we first started, now full of links. This was our suggestion. It's very, again, very much about the planning of the compact city. I don't believe really in two dimensional planning. It's not going to go down well with planners. Um, but I do believe that planning is about three dimensions. In other words, the magic of architecture is actually what makes it work. Uh, this doesn't mean it has to be uh, 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 iconic buildings, but it is, the, it is the relationship between the vertical and the horizontal which creates public, good public spaces. Here you see six, we'll call them towns, this is a diagram of about 200,000 uh, people each, uh, just, and, uh, and then the links across and transportation. Each one, of these, uh, uh, each one of these areas were so developed that uh, anybody could get either to the central park, which you can see in the left-hand plan, or to the outside park from their building walking-wise within 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, there was a major space was within 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and that's, there was a, a the, the circular, the light blue is a, a, a light railway. And um, the, it was a very much a mixed live-work leisure. The concept was to reduce the amount of energy by three quarters uh, in comparison with a town of this type. We didn't succeed because um, I, they were building it before we'd even finished the drawings and they were building their, their version, which you'll see, as you can see on the right hand, which is what it is. And in that sense, it's completely used, it lost this human, that humanism that cities like this had when they were, I remember well, seven, I think there were nine million, nine million uh, population, seven million uh, where people were still traveled on bicycles, that's mainly gone, unfortunately. Uh, here again, it's on the, the left of those two, you can see the concept of the uh, public space and radial uh, uh, sort of, uh, boulevards and the circular system where every building basically gets ventilation through where there's no buildings in front of them. And when a tall building in front, uh, there's always an uh, empty space in front of the tall buildings and so on to minimize the amount of energy. I'll just touch on, on climate change, because we all know, I think, are very conscious about that that is the, the most serious problem that mankind is facing. The globe will be all right. It's the question whether we'll have mankind here in the next 50 years. That's the real critical problem. Um, without wishing to go into it, I just am slightly challenged by Anne about iconic buildings and energy consumption. I just want to say you shouldn't just believe what you see. These again are a number of buildings which are, <laughs> which are uh, built by the practice. Uh, the Welsh Assembly, um, which is on Cardiff Bay, is probably the most efficient energy building that we've ever designed. Um, not least because what you see as glass is actually public space. It, there, there is no air conditioning. There's, you have to, in the winter you have to wear a coat and in the summer basically you can take your jacket off if you like. Basically, this is the whole of the ground floor of the Welsh Parliament. The ground floor on the section where the wooden model you can see is actually public space. The steps start, as you can see on the second one on the, uh, on the top line, start more or less in the Cardiff Bay. They move up and it's all open. And you see inside this of the Parliament, you see mothers and fathers with children with tra trams and so on, old people sitting down, having coffee, listening to music. The photograph down below shows that relationship, that's all public space. And those, these people, what they're looking down is the assembly space. The only part which is, could be air-conditioned because it gets very dense, actually it's very seldom, is actually the part that doesn't have windows. So what you've got is rather like an onion. The center part is where the debating chamber is. That is actually more as internal. There is a ventilation system and, a, and, and there is a certain amount of glass around the edges, as you see, but it's all protected. Therefore, that type of building, which is, one, is a very common one, and, uh, the right-hand one on the lower is the, the border courts has exactly the same concept. You separate the public space, which is and the glass is basically to cut down the, the wind, shall we say, and any form of heavy use goes on inside. And there's a ventilation system with, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in these buildings. There are opening windows. Everything opens. There is, as I said, no air, no air conditioning. And there's... You could argue in sustainable terms there are two elements. One is buildings should be transparent. Both the Welsh courts on the right-hand side and the, uh, the left-hand building, both uh, are uh, extremely efficient in terms of maximum bream energy consciousness. The middle building, 
which is a standard office building, which I thought I'd put there. That's got its large registry of shipping, that's got very and, uh, deep plan, therefore you need the maximum amount of glazing, but that has very sophisticated blinds. Basically, you can close the, and it's all uh, solar control, solar cell control. The blinds close or open, depending on the energy going in and out. So it's a dynamic two, uh, two, level, two layers of glass with blinds in, be uh, in between, which more is control and react to the, to the sun. Finally, just to, to say, obviously, uh, as an architect, I am passionate about architects, but I'm equally passionate about cities. I believe there's a tremendous relationship, and Anne and I have often discussed this, between obviously the built environment and the, uh, and, and the brutalization or the inclusion of the individual. Thank you very much. I don't think there's any particular magic uh, in the order, so I think I'm going to start with Roy Adams, um, who's from uh, Belfast, and is going to speak on the surprising survival of Belfast. <coughs> uh, I thought I was doing that tomorrow, but uh, um, what I'd like to speak on is actually, and I'm happy to do it with reference to Belfast, is the point that, that uh, Anne was making at the beginning about uh, cities being challenged by resources. And tomorrow, uh, I'll, ha I'll have some time to talk more specifically about Belfast in that regard. But um, one of the things that has certainly happened in most of the cities in, in Europe, and, uh, and I think also in America, is that where cities have been struggling, um, there has been a fundamental necessity to have some kind of partnership between all uh, the bodies that are involved, and I mean largely to do with uh, all the government and public sector bodies that are involved, because uh, the cost, the upfront costs of regeneration uh, defeat the private sector, which is motivated largely by profit. Um, well, it is motivated entirely by profit. Uh, and uh, what happens in a time of crisis uh, economic crisis is that um, governments are severely challenged by the resource constraints. And uh, one of the big problems that we will all face, uh, and I think this applies not just to the developed world but to the developing world as well, is how we are going to pay uh, to deal with the problems that are faced by communities which are challenged uh, which are disadvantaged, which are deprived uh, and distressed, and this spiral is what leads to conflict. And those conflicts, there are signs of those conflicts, not just in uh, some of the poorest countries in the world, but in some uh, development, developed countries. And I'm not just talking about Greece, which is severely challenged. There are many countries challenged in the same way. So. Uh, the main thing that I would like to talk about, uh, say in relation to regeneration, and uh, I do have a specific knowledge of Belfast, um, where uh, undoubtedly the springboard for regeneration, uh, which occurred in the 1980s, was, uh, was the fact that there was, at that time, direct rule from Westminster, and in a particular minister who succeeded Chris Patton in the role, uh, called Richard Needham, uh, who took the bull by the horns, put his own political career on the line, and went out and persuaded uh, uh, the then government, uh, and I think John Major was prime minister at that time, to invest the money to pump prime uh, some of the most difficult sites in Belfast. And that was what uh, really got the whole regeneration program moving. And it's happened in other cities, as we've heard. The problem is municipal authorities and governments do not have that kind of money now. And um, uh, it is my firm belief that because government is not able to meet these challenges, the private sector is not motivated to do it, the biggest challenge facing us is how we enable the third sector, the non-profit sector, to play a much greater role in intervening and dealing with urban regeneration. And so for the past year, myself and uh, a colleague in our small business have been looking at the whole issue 
of how we can um, turbocharge philanthropy, how we can uh, bring to bear much more resource uh, through, by this means. And if I asked you uh, how much of a, an average endowment fund do you think is spent on its charitable purposes a year, uh, you might think it's about 50% or 30% or 20%. It's actually 5% or less. And what we're looking at is a model that will multiply that. Uh, instead of the 5% that's sp spent, we're looking at a model that would, would generate 400%. And uh, I, can't, I don't have time to tell you how that works, but uh, not tonight anyway. But that is, that is the kind of challenge. Um, uh, Bruce talked about, um, well, I think Richard was talking very much and always talks a lot about the health of communities and the importance of communities to cities. If the community is dead, the city is dead. And uh, uh, equally, Bruce was talking about something that resembled, seems to resemble a coherent national strategy, <laughs> uh, which is very good. Um, especially as I was reading an article the other day that says, is America governable? But <laughs> interestingly, uh, in the Wall Street Journal of Monday uh, two weeks ago, uh, two reporters put a question to a number of people involved in, in different aspects of philanthropy. And the most interesting response, I'll stop here, Mr. Chow, was that from Dr. Judith Roden, who is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And the question was, if you had $10 billion, what would you spend it on? And uh, some of the other commentators were asked, said, well, well, medical research, one said statistics, all sorts of stuff. And she said, we would spend it on those who are innovators and have the ideas to tell us how we can make those billions into many more billions. Because she said, $10 billion is but uh, a drop of sand compared with the scale of the problems that uh, society is going to have to meet. And uh, that's really by way of uh, a challenge uh, to everybody concerned with the field and one which uh, I and others are taking uh, very seriously. Thank you. Uh, well, I like the idea of a 400% uh, return, but um, having heard from Mr. Madoff, we'll now hear from... Uh, <laughs> It's a non-profit organisation. <laughs> <laughs> it was his, it was his, yes, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Juan Alayo from uh, Bilbao, who's been involved in this uh, project all the way through. Good evening. Um, the question put to me was, um, why is Bilbao holding up a bit better than other Spanish cities? And the short answer, even though I'm no economist, uh, is that uh, it started from a much better position. Um, the economy of the Basque region is actually quite different to the um, economy of the rest of the Spain. Um, it's not only the, the you know, top of the league in terms of GDP per capita region of Spain, but if you actually were to compare that um, to the rest of Europe uh, in purchasing power standards, it's um, among the top sort of 10% in Europe. So if you're starting from there, uh, it's for some reason. Some of those reasons are it's a much more diversified economy. Uh, we're not sort of um, you know, a brick economy. The construction industry is much um, uh, less represented in the Basque country than in the rest of Spain. We've got more industrial um, uh, component uh, of the economy. We're actually net exporters. So in a way, uh, you're actually not comparing uh, like with like. Um, if you were to be looking at Europe as a comparison, uh, it would be interesting to look at that um, study by Eurostat in which um, uh, of the UK, for instance, the only region uh, in PPS that would be better off than the Basque country is in the London. Uh, in France, it would only be um, the Paris region. Um, in Italy, none of them. Um, in Germany, five of the landers that would be better off in PPS terms. So, in a way, you know, it's not you know, to be boasting here about, but it's just to say, we're not going to that, but it's because we start from a good position. Um, and in there, there's some elements of what Anne was referring to in terms of um, you know, human capital. The vast region's got the um, highest rate of graduates in science and technology. Uh, it's also got uh, the highest percentage of people with higher education, about 50% more than the average of Spain. 
So it's relatively well placed to, um, to weather the storm, if you could say that. But having said that, it's a very, very small economy. You know, we're only um, you know, 4 or 5% of um, Spain's and support of Spain population, Spain population. So, uh, you know, we know monsters there. We just go with the flow. You know, if the rest of the world is crashing around us, we're not going to be the only ones surviving, that's for sure. But, um, you know, we're doing reasonably okay. Unemployment is not the 18% of Spain, it's about 11%, which is bad, but, you know, it's almost there. The, the, you know, the drop in growth of GDP was a bit lower than Spain, but it was 3 times something as well. Maybe this year would be just, you know, even. Um, so all that is um, kind of a quick explanation about, um, you know, the Basque country and the Basque of the travails in these uh, circumstances. But I wanted to have just one minute to talk about uh, perhaps what it is the weakest link and, and something that relates very much back to the Phoenix um, city's theme in here. And it's if you look at what's the impact of all these in, in the cities, that's where you, you've got the most sort of um, vulnerable uh, elements. Uh, cities actually, even in Spain, don't collect much of their income. You know, roughly Bilbao can more or less claim to collect 30% of their income. The rest is given, is given to them by high-level administrations. If the funds don't come in, and last year the drop in income by the tax authority, which is actually the regional authority, was about 16%. That means we've both got to cut this budget, and quite radically. And what happens is that from growing, you know, in four years by about 50%, Bilbao's budget has had to come back from 2010 to the level of 2007. In number terms, it's not a massive drop, just about 10%. But what happens is that when you look at cities, their expenditure is very rigid. I mean, 30% roughly is just uh, personnel costs. And of the rest, Normally, the biggest chunk is to take care of the physical fabric of the city, about 30-something, 30 34%, depends on the years. And the rest, you know, the other 30% or 30 odd is police, uh, fabric aid, uh, social activities, that, that's, there's not a lot you can cut up there. So what happens? That for this year, the upkeep of the city is being cut by 30-something percent. And if you look at that and you think that this is not a one-year storm, it's going to take a long time, what happens with a city that has been pouring billions of money in public infrastructure, the public domain, you know, just our own company, which is an urban regeneration company, spent nearly 100 million in the last year. And that's the physical fabric of the city. If you're actually cutting back in maintenance, how long will it take before decline sets in again and you go through the whole cycle of Phoenix City? I'm not saying the love is in that straight at the moment. I'm saying, okay, this is a crisis sort of uh, budget and you have to do what you can. But the broader question is how many cities actually consider that going through this um, improvement of the image, you know, these new suits they all got, um, how much will it take to cover the maintenance and replacement costs of all those brand new parks and wonderful walks and whatever in years to come? And finally, now, if you ask that to some of the people that manage those cities, they don't have an answer in society. So I just leave that on the table as a question mark for the next stage. Thank you very much, Juan. And we'll now move on to Oliver Feigl, um, who is going to give us a German perspective from Germany's shrinking cities. Well, well thank you. Um, there are at least 17 perspectives in Germany. Um, <laughs> but, uh, nevertheless, um, <coughs> When well, the question was raised about uh, how to survive the financial and economic crisis from the city's perspective, uh, from a city's perspective, the first thing I thought about was this is not new. This is not something very unusual. Um, let's talk about cities like Leipzig because it's in the uh, weak market cities uh, field. Uh, if a city is losing 90% of its workforce in the industrial sector in two years, this is something that is tremendous. It's because of the change of the system. If a city has to face 80% of its housing stock in need of renovation. This is something tremendous. Um, I think if we think about the stimulus, uh, about the, not stimulus packages, not, not, not now, not yet, uh, about the crisis, there are some processes in Germany, at least, that are new. This crisis was for the stronger regions, especially. It, was, it hit the strongest region in the country, the ones that were export-orientated. And unlike the US economy, as you all might know, the German economy is strongly export-orientated. It's 40% of our GMP that goes into exports. 
Uh, it's about leadership in technology that needs higher resources in order to make the productive region stronger. And German cities having their own tax revenues and their own rights to raise taxes, they had enormous problems and they will need financial support. Um, so this is one thing that is new. Um, the other thing that was new about this crisis is that the credit crunch, I don't know if this is the right translation, the, the problems of uh, companies to get money, enough money from the banks, hit the small and medium-sized enterprises strongest. <coughs> and these are the backbone of our economy. So uh, basically, it's, this is the really new thing about it. It's not new that the crisis is increasing social inequality. We have the mechanisms and the funds uh, uh, to, to react against that, even if we don't manage to uh, compensate completely. But the question is, what does a situation like that mean for a country uh, like Germany, which is 80% of its GMP <coughs> located in urban regions, 60% of its population? It's a highly urbanized country, and it's a country that's even more dependent on its cities when it comes to competing internationally. Uh, in economy uh, than uh, when it comes to the, rare, to, to the bare figures. I think looking back at the Phoenix cities, and that makes the project so, so extremely valuable for us. That's the reason why we support the next phase of this project. Uh, looking back to the Phoenix cities, that's something that helps. Um, these cities were faced with enormous challenges. They were faced with these challenges with support of the national governments, of the state governments, whatsoever, whatsoever or without support. Uh, but basically, uh, these cities were incubators for ideas. Uh, basically, these cities showed to us that um, <coughs> on the one hand side, innovation is above all a local thing. Innovation in instruments is a local thing. Um, for a federal government, that's some, sometimes difficult to learn that innovation and best ideas come from the local level uh, because we are sometimes a bit far away from, from, from the real world. Real world. So, uh, this is the one thing we learned. And the other thing, is, uh, other thing we learned is um, uh, that it's most important uh, to cooperate and that it's most important to use the public money we have in an intelligent way. Um, so cooperation, what is the cooperation about? Every, every one of you working in a local or state or federal government agency will know that cooperation, inter-agency cooperation is something you normally don't want to tackle because you won't, you won't survive it, basically. But um, we have to do it, anyhow, because uh, as soon as funds are getting scarce, as soon as you are running out of money, uh, the only way to, to, to ch change something in the city, from the grassroots level, is to cooperate, to, to share funds, and you know, in order to increase the effects. Uh, on the other hand side, it's necessary to cooperate between public and private. This is something that was extremely weak in Germany in the, uh, 20 years ago. There was the state and federal level, they did the things and the private level was complaining and basically was paying taxes. This changed a lot in the last 20 years. It changed because problems got bigger. And I think basically that um, as difficult as uh, managing a crisis might be, and there have been many crises in the last years, uh, there's a tremendous chance because people get another understanding of how, of how to deal with things. Uh, if money gets, gets scarce, if you don't have any more money, you have to, you have to rely on ideas. I think it's something that the seven cities, and many other cities, at least in Germany, I know, uh, teaches. Um, I think the second thing we have to learn is, um, oh, by the way, that's the, that's the reason why in 2007 we were working on the Leipzig Charter. It ba basically is focusing on cooperation and on the other side on uh, intervention in, in, in difficult, problematic neighborhoods. But this is the thing. And 27 member states of the EU together said this is something that is important. Um, okay, the, the other thing is investment. It, we, all the major countries, uh, had enormous stimulus packages in order to overcome the crisis. At the beginning, I was not quite sure if this makes sense because if you're spend, spending 60, 70 million, a billion pounds, uh, on a stimulus package, uh, uh, the lessons learned from the past is it's, it evaporates in thin air normally. Um, but if you do that, if you take this money into your hand in order to stimulate economy, then please do it in a way that is uh, uh, focusing on the future. That means do not stabilize uh, what, what is normally happening all the time. Do not stabilize or, or support uh, uh, structures of the past, but support innovation. And this is one of the major advantages of a crisis. Normally, politically, 
you will not survive to change existing structures in a tremendous way, saying, okay, this is something we had for 20, 30, 40, sometimes even 100 years, but now it doesn't help us in the future. Um, so basically, in a crisis, you can change a lot of things you can't change in, in economically strong times. And the third lesson for us, um, but if it's too late, it's too late, uh, is don't start too late. <laughs> um, uh, for us in Germany, sometimes we have the <coughs> enormous problem that uh, processes are very slow. We have always, always, always to find consensus between federal and state governments. That means changing the course of things is sometimes extremely difficult. Um, but sometimes, as we learned a year ago, this is made a major advantage. Since 40 years now, state and federal governments are uh, cooperating on uh, economic, uh, urban development, um, what is it? Urban development support programs, basically, that should enable uh, uh, municipalities uh, to deal with the challenges of the future, to, to raise the potentials out of the problems. And we have this tradition of 40 years, and the major advantage for us was when the government agencies came up with, okay, let's spend 60 billion, 50 billion euros on stimulus packages. We have to say, okay, we have the way to cooperate and we have the, the topics that count. And because we were quite quick on that, we were able to, uh, to secure at least, depending on how you calculate the, pro uh, the programs, 30% uh, of the money spent on urban issues, on social and education issues. Okay, so that is, I think this is a chance. And basically what we did with the money only uh, to end up, I have three minutes and I'm far too much of a coward in order to not obey when I'm telling you three minutes. Um, it's, we concentrated on, on renovating, for, ex no, for example, renovating uh, uh, education, uh, educational institutions, schools, kindergartens, universities. And we tried to combine not only this potential for the future we wanted to set up, but also to reduce uh, uh, um, the, the carbon dioxide emissions by saying, hey, if we renovate them, then what we should do is should be according to the lowest standards possible, and standards in Germany are quite strict normally. So uh, we, we were dealing with a modernizing infrastructure of the 1960s and 80, uh, 70s and 80s, especially 60s and 70s. Uh, because on the one hand side, in many shrinking cities, this is the essential question of the future, how to finance that. And on the other hand side, this is a potential for reducing, once again, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, we were focusing uh, this money or concentrating this money on brownfield redevelopment. We want to strengthen, strengthen the qualities of the German of the European city. That means being compact, working against for supporting um, Renaissance. So basically, um, I think crisis sometimes is a chance. This crisis is very much of a crisis. Um, and I think it's bringing us through our limits, but financially. Um, but it's raising new ideas, so that's the positive thing about it. Thank you, Oliver. I'm surprised in a way you didn't mention some of the biggest and most difficult cities which are now financially supported by the German federal government, like Athens, Thessaloniki, <laughs> Piraeus. Um, but um, uh, there's, there are a few rules at the LSE, but one I have discovered is you can't have an event with urban or cities in the title without Tony Travers speaking at it. So, Tony. <laughs> Lovely to see you too, Hal. Um, right. <laughs> What we've been discussing, it seems to me, this evening is cities that have felt the ultimate force of deindustrialization. I think there's a common agreement about that. But we have, and we've had in this project, a fascinating comparator set of, de of cities. European cities where there has been sufficient, or at least reasonable investment and equalization type resources in order to avoid the worst aspects of hollowing out. Mm -hmm. compared with American cities which have traditionally have had much less of that kind of intervention. Having said that, I think it's interesting to look at many parts of Europe, certainly in the UK, to see how uh, despite all of this upper level intervention and equalization, there is still a significant decline in the populations and a, re a real problem of hollowing out in many of the cities uh, within the UK that have declined. I think the evidence within the United Kingdom of all the interventions that this project has considered, that the, the evidence is mixed. 
Uh, some cities, and or at least parts of some cities, have regenerated and improved, whereas some parts and some whole cities are still in relative decline. No doubt about that, we can't deny that fact. In a number of the older industrial cities, it's very interesting to look that there's been a decline in private sector employment during the long economic upturn in recent years, which is not a good sign. Much of the growth in employment has come because of public programs. And that, of course, means that those programs are now going to go into decline, which means that the ex some of the ex-industrial towns, with the cities which have built up public sector employment, have now got a new declining industry called the public sector, which is a significant problem, not for all, but for some. I think the new financial and economic situation that all these cities find themselves in will further test their capacity, uh, remembering that all the interventions that have been discussed here today have to some extent been fighting the market. This is all fighting the market. It's all doing something which politicians at all levels have to do, can never say they won't do, will always say their city will survive, but they are fighting the market. And you have to remember that because, of course, we always have to win in this particular struggle, but it is a struggle of that kind. We're now going to discover, in this new, new economy, I think, which investments and interventions have really worked. Uh, we've got some evidence from the recession so far in the UK that claimant count unemployment has often grown fastest in the older peripheral industrial cities. And that's not great news. It suggests that, though the interventions haven't failed everywhere, they have not worked as well in some of the older industrial places as certainly to allow them to compete with Cambridge or Reading or Milton Keynes or the fast-growing towns and cities in the south. Moreover, we know in this country, and it's true in almost all the major industrial countries, public spending and other public interventions will fall sharply. In this country, capital investment by the state is going to fall by 60%, 60 percent, six zero percent, between 2011 and 2015, an extraordinary fall with revenue spending also constrained. And that means that many of the investments that have been made in recent years to ensure public sector activity and so on are going to stop. And the question then is, can the private sector fill the gap? I think the difficulty there is that mu much, though not all, of the regeneration of many of the cities in this country was in part posited on the idea of bubble economics. It required a rising land values and rising, rising asset values to continue to reinvest, to get private sector investors in, and so on. Now, if we're denied both the public sector investment and that, the question is, what, for a while, is going to fill the gap? So, uh, always to conclude in a gloomy way, <laughs> Uh, I do think that the challenge that now lies ahead for the Phoenix cities, not only of course in the UK, is the question of how to stimulate private sector employment. I think Bruce was very much on about that. We've, the only way for Britain now is going to be private sector employment, not only to get the economy itself growing, but to replace the public sector jobs that are going to disappear. Against a background where there will be a risk that environment and design standards will fall because there is less public expenditure. We've made big improvements in most towns and cities that can't be sustained without ingenuity. And I think in the end, uh, and, and, and the Basque region always makes this uh, case for me, self-sufficiency. At some level, all the Basque region is the most self-sufficient region in Europe in my, my understanding of public finance. And there's a lot to be said for it. And it seems that looking ahead, that the Phoenix cities will need to be able to use more of their own generated resources to reinvest locally, as we've heard from Belfast, because they're not going to be able to rely on the government in the way they have in the past. So I think this finally takes us right back to where we started at the beginning of this evening, which is you know, looking at Anne's slide about Phoenix, the Phoenix. I mean, the question we're left with is, can the phoenixes, all of these phoenixes, continue to be rekindled back into life. We're fighting the market, we're going to have to fight it harder now. The question will be more difficult to answer as we look ahead.
Thanks very much, Tony. Now, we've run a bit over time, and I want to hear from uh, Julia Unwin in a moment from Roundtree, but who's also actually going to talk about the next steps in this project because it's not over. Uh, but before we do that, I think uh, it might be best if I just put a couple of questions, particularly uh, to the uh, invited guests here this evening, um, and then we'll hear from Julia. And let me, Bruce, uh, you painted an inspiring image of the way the metros could revive, and in the middle of it, you place a lot of importance on universities, which is uh, always polite to do when you come to a university. Uh, but I've got to tell you that um, if you read your Financial Times here, what you hear about is the University of California system being right. devastated, right. and you hear about state universities with no money, uh, increasing their tuition fees so that they're more or less up to private universities. You hear about a university system in crisis. How does that, how, could you, how do you square that circle with your optimistic message uh, with what we hear? Uh, several things. Uh, the United States, one of the, the fastest growing export service in the United States is foreign students. So we want to educate the rest of the world. It's an $18 billion industry right now. Um, and if we could get over the visa issues and the 9-11 issues, um, we need to bring the talent of the world to the United States, not just for the near term uh, to, to basically solve some of these fiscal issues, but for the long term so we create the social connections between America and the rising nation. So that's number one. Number two, um, someone said to me from McKinsey about two months ago that higher education in the United States is a productivity sinkhole. So um, there are some places to cut. And um, so we're going to have to wrench some efficiencies out of this system. And, 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 and I think lastly, um, we are, this is a, an issue, we are moving towards more of a privatization of our public sector universities. Um, they are less and less reliant on state aid uh, because of the vagaries of the political marketplace. Uh, that, in turn, drives some efficiencies. That, in turn, will raise tuition. And we will shift some of the cost of this to individuals. Now, the federal government may ultimately, and Obama tried to do this in the stimulus package, try to subsidize low and moderate income students so they can still afford this. But I think there's still room in the United States to reform the higher education sector. And there is ample room uh, to use our advanced research system to become the educator of the world. Thank you. Well, we have 3,000 British students. Perhaps we'll send them to you. We could uh, recruit another 3,000 foreign ones. Who, um, anyway, that would be a, that would be a deal. Um, Richard, you, you mentioned in the middle of your presentation uh, briefly the switch of policy on affordable housing in, in London with the switch of uh, mayor. Uh, if I ask you to look forward to the possibility of a Conservative government, we don't know whether that's going to happen, but if there, if there were one, how do you think that would change the policy environment for cities? Would it make much difference or not? I suspect it will make uh, some difference, quite a lot of uh, difference. We're going to see more power to the local, the boroughs, to the suburban organized institutions, um, and uh, probably less in the, in the center. Just for going forward, I mean, Clearly, I'm the only person in this whole room who is not an economist, I suspect. Um, my optimism, which is much more powered by the concept of imagination and change, um, is that there will be changes. There always have been changes. I remind people, you know, in the 1980s, we were discussing where big business should move, which, of the, which city in Germany should big business move from London. Uh, it never happened. Um, and though, of course, the economy has been strengthened continuously in, within Germany. And the point I want to make is that I don't, we can do a certain amount about um, trying to control the economic situation, but I think we also have to go beyond where we are now. We, you know, 30 years hence, it will be very different. It's how can we prepare the society? How can we 
pair the, the, the governments were with towards a longer view. I think very likely we are seeing the end of American capitalism as the only state, the only way, the way forward. In fact, I'm going to I'd take it better on it. Um, we may say as America, the states as being one of the ones. Um, in terms of, of this country, in one sense, it's done much better than we thought. When we thought. I'm going to say again, uh, in the 1980s, with sort of inflation running at about 20%. Um, and nobody would have imagined that. So whilst trying, I think, to invest in infrastructure, uh, to invest money for employment, to invest in sort of retrofitting, to invest in all those areas which uses employment, I think there is room for optimism, whatever the government is in. Thank you. Uh, Anne, let me give you the last word before I turn to Julia. Tell us what was the most inspiring thing you saw. Tony has tried to make us all feel terminally <laughs> gloomy, which is his, uh, his role in life, I've discovered. But, um, uh, but it cheer us up. What did, I mean, of all of the, when you looked at all these cities, and what, what, what was the most inspiring change that you saw that you took away with you from this research? Well, actually, there are three, and I'll be really, really quick. So going around Leipzig with Oliver and being able to see all the marks of a former communist city that had actually been left devastated. It lost more jobs than any of our other cities. It lost 90% of its jobs with reunification, actually pulling itself back together and deciding to redensify the city and then actually starting to succeed was fantastically. It was very, very exciting, alongside discovering that Goethe and uh, Johann Sebastian Bach were closely connected with the city, that those were very special things. Um, going to Belfast, by coincidence, at the point where the crane that had helped to lift the Titanic and the people of Belfast had refused to allow to be demolished, so it's a listed monument to an old regime, being the only place within Europe where a sea turbine, which is a vast, vast industrially produced machine, could actually be craned into water and therefore having to be built in Belfast, being a kind of ironic bonanza for the city, um, added to which the sea turbine has outperformed all predictions, whereas wind turbines... So wind turbines go up, sea turbines go down, and the wind turbines produce about 30% of prediction and the Belfast sea turbine didn't kill seals and produces over prediction so over the 100% prediction the third was when we took Bruce and his crew about six Americans and EU people to Sheffield and they heard the city officials explaining what they were actually doing to piece back a totally devastated city because it was the steel city there were only 45 jobs left in steel when we visited. Bruce saying, God, these entrepreneurs in Sheffield, they are brilliant if only we had them in America. <laughs> Talking about local government officials. <laughs> <laughs> in Sheffield. So I think those were three very inspiring things. Thanks very much. Well, of course, there is political leadership on developing young enterprise in um, Belfast, isn't there? Irish Robinson, after all, did in fact generate a new uh, a business run by uh, a young person, which was uh, very imaginative. Julia. Um, Nothing to do know. with me. I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let your colleague talk about Irish Robinson. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very conscious I stand between you and the drink that the LSE have offered you, so I should be quick. We've come here this evening to celebrate this vital piece of work, but we're also celebrating the power of cities to reinvent themselves to think again, to use that sort of creativity that Anne has just described. And this work has happened at an absolutely crucial moment in our thinking about cities, because in the time this work has taken place, we have discovered, if we didn't already know it, that we're running out of money, we're running out of carbon, we're running out of oil, that for the foreseeable future, we will be managing these great cities with far, far less than we've ever had before. For the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, it's been a privilege to be associated with this important piece of work for three very different reasons. Partly because it goes to the heart of what we do. We're interested in evidence from research, how it links with evidence from real experience, 
and how we can bring those two bits of evidence together to be truly influential. I think this piece of work gives us a very important story for lasting and powerful influence. So that's one reason we were pleased and delighted to be part of it. The second reason is because we're concerned about place, concerned about the nature of cities, the nature of the communities that exist within those cities, how they interact, and the role of neighbourhoods and communities in making those cities strong. And this work takes our, takes our knowledge forward hugely on that. And thirdly, we're interested in it because our focus in the last year has been on thinking about what a post-recession economy can look like. How can the economy we merge into after this appalling world recession be both more sustainable and more just? And I echo the points Richard Rogers made about the inequality that is so very unjust at the moment. For those three reasons, this work has been fantastically important to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And we're honoured to be involved in producing this influential and I would say very beautiful book. There are not many books about public policy you would say that about, but this book is a very beautiful one which I think will make a real difference. But I'm particularly pleased that others are now supporting this vital journey. I'm delighted to hear that the government in the UK through communities and local government, the government in Germany and in France are all supporting the next stage of this work because the network of city reformers that is so based in the practical lived experience of these cities is a powerful one. We at Joseph Rowntree Foundation will continue to contribute by running some further international seminars, but the importance of this work going on into its next phase, supported by others, not by ourselves, I think will help us all to deal with the huge challenges of the 21st century. How will our cities survive with so few resources, with so many people living in them, and yet, as so many people have said today, with such imagination and creativity, which this book has highlighted. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia, for those remarks, but also for your support. Um, I'm going to thank the panel, Juan, Oliver, uh, Tony, and Roy, and then um, particularly Bruce for coming over from uh, Brookings for, the, for this, and Richard for... Uh, coming from Chelsea. Uh, coming from Chelsea, <laughs> indeed, all the way, uh, which can take longer sometimes. But um, uh, uh, you'll all be able uh, to have a drink and talk to the authors, not only Anne, but Anne really is a kind of a, a sort of brand like Damien Hurst. The real people who write the stuff um, are... Uh, uh, Astrid and Jörg, who are in the audience. But congratulations, really, Anne, for bringing this to this point. It's a great book, and it's extremely interesting work. Thank you. Thank you.